uh, quantitative analysis. Um, I hope you guys got your books. If you haven't, please let us know. I'll get Divya to give you your copy. Um, I'm just gonna I've just popped open the table of contents uh, to show you what chapters we're gonna cover in quants. Uh, because quants is gonna be a continual session, we should finish this book before we move on to FMP. Um, so the first chapter, unfortunately, is uh, introduction, not testable material for the exam. Uh, but you need to know this before you even launch yourself into the rest of the calculations. It's considered pre-knowledge. Now, since you signed up with us and we said we'll look after you from start to finish, which means we need to give you this basic knowledge, but please trust me, you're not going to get direct questions on this on the exam. So don't spend considerable effort studying this chapter alone. Right? Uh, so that we're going to hit on time value money basics today. Um, the next, we're going to start off with probabilities and statistics. And you have a series of chapters from Michael Miller. Uh, so you've got chapter 2, 6, 3, 4, and 5. Uh, we're going to finish this block. Uh, the objective is within two classes. Um, and then the next series of chapters is about regression. right? Uh, for those of you who are coming from a CFA background, regression is usually done in CFA level 2. So you will automatically feel the heat or the tempo pick up. Don't be surprised. right? Uh, because what CFA guys do in level 1, it's just the probabilities and the, the statistics. Uh, level two is what they do this, so you feel the pain a little bit. To make matters worse, uh, the pain even further gets, you know, uh, higher. When you move to the next block, which is Francis Diamond, his name itself has died in it. So these chapters are, you know, uh, excruciatingly uh, challenging, right? But they need this to say it's not impossible, right? If you understand the concepts, most of the questions from this set will be theory, right? Which means you just need to get a broad overview rather than you know actually crunching numbers. So this is something we're gonna earmark as challenging and we know about it so when we enter it we don't feel scared. A of absolute critical importance is chapter 10. No excuses, you've gotta do it. I know it's challenging, but it's actually very easy and exam questions do revolve around this. Maybe not one question, maybe not two questions, even three or four questions can come from this. Um, also because this chapter is kind of like a prerequisite to book number four when we do valuations. The rest of the chapters are pretty much theory again, correlation, copulas, and followed by simulation modeling. At the end of the book, you have your statistical tables. Uh, so the Z table, T table, Y table, and F table. On the exam day, you will only be given the Z table. The other tables will not be provided, right? Um, however, you're still required to look up numbers on these tables in the event that they provide you a small excerpt or a snapshot of the table so you can pick up your numbers relevantly, right? So um, this is pretty much uh, the quant section. Now, the weight of quant on your program, I'm just going to put my slides back on. Okay. Uh, quants is 20% of the portion. Um, usually when I'm carrying students through quants, I assume as if they're not going to do well, right? Because uh, I've, I've seen in the past the amount of effort you need to put in to reap rewards, the ratio is very challenging. So if you feel the pain, I assure you it's not the only topic uh, where, you know, that this is the end of the world. No, uh, you can, there are many more scoring chapters coming up ahead in financial markets and um, valuations. But this doesn't mean that you ignore this content. Because this is the underlying to everything that you will see in other books. We usually, in the past, always started with quants um, because we couldn't touch upon anything other than uh, after, if we hadn't done this. Um, but in the past, when we started with quants, it set very grim tone with the students going, oh my god, I find so hard. So that's why for you guys, we and met some batches earlier, we started with foundations, which was an introduction to risk before we actually push you in the deep and say, okay, now start to swing. All right, so 20 questions on the exam day. Today's chapter that we're going to do is time value money basics. I repeat, it's optional reading, not testable on the exam day directly. Will be tested indirectly, right? Um, so, so most of you guys would have received a calculator. Uh, I hope you've managed to uh, rip the packaging open. Uh, if you need support with it, please let me know. Otherwise, I hope everything is okay. So today we're going to start first step understanding your calculator. Word of advice, um, it's the most frustrating device you will ever come across, right? Especially in the beginning. Uh, you know, pressing one button versus another can have a world of a difference when it comes to your computation, but be patient with yourself, right? Uh, avoid the urge of flinging it against the wall. I've had students who done that. Uh, it just means that the calculator breaks and you have to buy a new one. So it doesn't 
add any value. So uh, understand your calculator, differentiate between simple interest and compounding of interest, um, how interest rates are determined, uh, various definitions or words that may, they may use in place of interest rates. Uh, calculate the present value and future value of a single amount, ordinary annually, perpetually, unequal series of cash flows. Calculating present value and future value with different compounding periods, monthly, quarterly, semi-annually. And then lastly, sometimes we just don't want to calculate present value and future value. Sometimes we already have an idea of what I have to invest today and what I'm going to get at the end. I want to know what I am earning. So I want to calculate my rate of interest or uh, I sometimes want to know to, if I invest 500 today, how long will it take me to get uh, 1,000 grams uh, in the future, given that the market interest rates are 5%. So I want to work out how long my investment needs to be, or in some cases, which is very popular, we all know we're going to retire one day, right? Um, and so we need to save for retirement. So if I have a target goal that I want to retire with at least 2 million dirhams, so that I don't have to worry about money in the future, how much do I need to save each month to get to that target, the PMD? Right? So don't worry, we'll explain all these definitions as we move along the way uh, when you're studying with the calculator. Step one, your calculator, your best friend. Please, do not let me catch you using any Casio or Office calculator. I know they're convenient, it's faster for you to do calculation, but you can't carry those into the exam. Right? So what's the point? Your fingers need to master that calculator because you'll soon realize Speed on that calculator means a lot. You have only two minutes and 20 seconds to solve a question. And there is a lot of intense calculation coming your way in book three, Financial Markets and Products, right? So um, get familiar with this device as best as you can because it's only gonna improve your performance on the exam day. Please don't forget it at home, right? That's why we delayed it and we didn't give it to you because we wanna make sure everyone had their calculators today. If you don't have a calculator today, make sure you're just referring to your friend's calculator so that you're, you're sharing one and you're following what we're doing today. So, step one, on off, inaugurate it. But press the on button and get it started. Now, as a guideline, we often tell the students that um, the accuracy, so, I'll start again. You turn it on, right? Um, as you can see, your calculator has two types of text. Text on the button, and text slightly above the button, right? Text on the button, so if I press, let's say, one, it will automatically type one on the screen. But if I want to access the text on top, which says date, then I need to press the yellow button, which is called the second, and then one. It will automatically take me to an application inside the calculator. Are we okay with this? So your calculator has dual functions. It can do things which is written on the button, and it can do things that are written above the button in yellow. Whenever you want to access a yellow function, you need to press the yellow button first. It's like a shift key on your keyboard, all right? Now, first things first, you need to set your calculator to nine decimal places. Your calculator's default setting is two decimal places, right? Um, why do we need nine? First, one reason is because FRM says that when you're doing calculations, do not round up until the sixth decimal place even intermediate calculations, right? So, which means that uh, you need to maintain accuracy. Now, six decimal places, although great, why are we asking you for nine? Is because um, six decimal places clutter your calculator a lot. Let's demonstrate. So, press the second button with me, and press the decimal button because we're looking for format. On your screen, you should see DEC. All good? Type six. So, press the six. And then press enter on top. When you press enter on top, automatically an equal to sign will appear. The calculator is telling you I have accepted your number, right? Press second again and press quit. Quit is just above, right? Now you've come out of the application, you'll see your screen has so many zeros on it. It's because it's showing you six decimal places. Your calculator is cluttered, you can't see much, right? We recommend, this is Edge's recommendation, and of course on the internet also a lot of people recommend to set your calculator to nine decimal places. Nine decimal places means we're not compromising accuracy, and nine decimal places means we are not cluttering your screen. So let's try it again. Second, the dot, you go back to DC, type nine, press enter on top, 
right? So you set it to nine decimal places, second and quit. Now you're out of the calculator. You will see only one zero on your screen. All good? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. Now, to make sure that you've got the right number of decimals, try this with me. Do one divided by 11 equals two. And you should see your screen fill up with all the decimals you need, right, without having to clutter your screen. Anyone having issues, please call out my name and I'll come over and I'll help you fix it. But we need to move together, which is very, very important. All good? Okay, now, the, rate, the, the rest of the basics of your calculator. Uh, on the side, on the right hand side, you have your operator keys. So you've got divide, multiply, minus, plus, equal to. In the center, you've got your regular numeric keypad, right, where you can punch in your numbers. I'd like to emphasize on the difference between this plus and minus sign and this plus and minus sign. When do we use these? So if I want to do five minus three, then I will use this minus sign, and I will press equal to. But if I want to enter minus eight, then I will type in eight first, and then I will give it a symbol minus. All good? So this is to give numbers a symbol, and this is to do the actual math behind the numbers. Everybody okay with this? Perfect. Now, I'm just going to walk you through some uh, basic functions. Let's say I want to enter into my calculator um, 0.85%. Now, I'm math challenged. Um, people consider me to be smart, but you know, you soon realize I can't do mental math. That's a weakness um, I've soon learned to, um, you know, accept. Come. That's the only thing left. Come. On. Where's your calculator? Oh, okay. I need it. Okay, so um, I can't do the decimals in my head, so I often use a calculator for support, and I'm sure someone in the group room would be like me, I hope, so I have a friend. So I type 0 0.85 in the calculator first, and then I press the percentage button here, all right? Uh, it automatically makes it 0 0.0085, right? So that's your percentage button. If you ever want to do square root, so you're doing 36 square root, uh, your square root button is here. So you type 36 first, then press square root. You should get equal to 6, okay? Uh, if you ever want to do square, which is, uh, you know, 3 to the power of 2, uh, just hit the square button 3 and then square button and you will get 9. All right? Um, 1 over x stands for reciprocal. Basically, if you have a number 5 and you want to do it as a fraction, 1 divided by 5, type 5, press the 1 over x button, it will become 1 over 5. And it becomes 0 0.2. Everybody okay? These are your brackets, which you may use for calculation. And y to the power of x is in the event you want to take 3 to the power of 3, then Notice there is no cube button here. You will use y to the power of x. The way to do this calculation will be you will type 3, you will type y, x, you will type 3 again, and you will hit the equal to sign. All good? Okay. Now, there are many, many other functions on this calculator. Um, over time, um, we'll get familiar with them. I trust you, but I assure you that. Um, and, um, you know, with practice, you will find secrets in your calculator which makes your working a lot faster and easier. Um, try not to oppose your calculator. I get a lot of people say, no, 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 I'll just do it in my head, right? Or I don't do it with the calculator. Trust me, you're losing out uh, because the more you use this device, the better you get on the exam paper. Now, um, we're going to mostly focus our study alongside this green block of numbers, which is in gray on your calculator. Or, uh, and this blue block of numbers, which is above um, the gray buttons, right? Now, what do these gray or white buttons on your screen, on your calculator represent? This is for time value of money. So when you want to deal with investments that you make today, and you want to work out what their future worth is, we're going to use that, all right? And the relevance for cash flow, NPV, and IRR will come up soon. Any doubts so far? Okay. Uh, the next frustrating thing about your calculator is the way to clean your calculator and erase its memory. There are many ways of doing this. 
and each technique is different for your application. So be patient, and I will walk you through all the steps one by one. So notes about your calculator, purchase and use your calculator during your exam study. Please do not delay your purchase. Uh, for the exam, use only the FRM approved calculators, the ones most of you have, the gray one, with, which we've distributed today is the HP, uh, sorry, the BA2 Plus. Some of you who already own a calculator, the slightly more metallic one is the BA2 Plus Professional. Both of them are acceptable. Um, the other calculators that are recommended is HP 12C and the HP 12C Platinum. These come a little bit more expensive. They're harder to use, uh, so I usually don't recommend them. I personally have used the one you guys are using right now today in class, the plastic version. No other calculator will be permitted in the exam room. No spare calculator will be permitted in the exam room. You're allowed only one. So make sure before the exam day, you replace the battery in that damn thing. The last thing you want is you're prepared and your calculator gives up on you. Right? So it's always a good idea to carry a spare. You can't do that anymore. Um, and or replace the battery inside your calculator before the exam day. Read your calculator user guide. Your calculator came with a little black book. Right? Um, read it if you have some time. If not, of course, I'm walking you through uh, the usage of the calculator. Um, set your calculator display to nine decimal places. How many of us remember what was the way of setting it to nine decimal places? Go on, shoot. What do we do first? Format. Second? Format. Format. So please write it down because guess what? When you sit your first test, my team will reset your calculators. And then the first panic we get is, I forgot how to set my decimals. So we don't want that situation. Second, format. Then what do we do? Yeah. No, we That's type nine, 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 nine. nine. And then we came out of the application by second. Wait. So like this, whatever we do on the calculator, make sure you're not noting down steps. Because trust me, when you go home, you'll forget. Um, always clear your calculator memory after every question. This is of the utmost importance. And I will explain how to clear the calculator's memory um, when we're doing the math. The basic calculator keys that we will be using today for your time value of money questions are N, the number of periods you are earning interest, the number of compounding periods. I, Y, Y, the interest that you're earning per period. PV means present value, FV means future value. PMT is a regular stream of payments you make each period. CPT, which is on the top uh, left of your calculator, right here, CPT, we'll be using that a lot, it's called compute. So whenever you want a calculator to do some math for you, it's compute. Um, and then we're going to use something called the BGN mode, which is slightly here. So if you look at the PMT button, and a little above it, in yellow, it says BGN. So we'll be getting to that in a bit. Oh, one thing. Is PMT payment from public period? This is a regular, like a fixed, fixed stream of money. Not the unequal cash. Not unequal cash. Okay. good? OK. So let's get started with uh, the basics on uh, time value of money. So does anybody know the difference between simple interest and compounding of interest? Simple, it's uh, one, one time a year. Yeah. Compounding, it's keep compounding. Which are quarterly, monthly, um, uh, monthly. It's, 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 it's not very comfortable with the simple interest. Yeah. The simple interest means that you have to do with the, the frequency. Um, it could, so you can earn simple interest more than once a year. Um, it has to do with the, the way the interest is. Interest interest interest. Interest. Yes. Very nice. So the interest is only calculated on your principal. So interest could be given to you every month. But it's always based on what you put into the account, not based on what the account's total worth is. Compounding of interest is interest on the original money you placed, as well as every period's interest you are earning. So as a quick example, in case we have anybody who is not so savvy with these, uh, let's say today at T0, I place 1,000 in the account, right? And the bank has promised me an interest of 5% per annum. At T1, um, we will earn 5%, which would be 1050. Yeah? yeah, help me with the mental plan. Yeah? And then, which is, so th if this is simple interest, you, your 1000 stays as is, 
the interest you earned was 50. The next period in T2, again, your 1000 will stay as is. The same interest 50 will carry over and you will again earn another interest of 50. Nothing extra. But in compounding, you will, your account will go from 1000 to 1050 and on this again you will earn 5%. So can someone do the math and tell me what it is? Come on, you all have calculators now. And get into the mood of doing things for me because I don't have one. 52.5. 52.5, so this will become 1150. Uh, 1, 2.5. Right? So you will earn 52.5 more. So your account will go to 101.02.5. Questions? Now, if you are on the investor's perspective, which one would you prefer? Simple interest or compounding interest? Compounding. compounding, you get more money out of it, right? Now, notice in compounding, we can further talk about the frequency of compounding. Now, over here, if the bank tells me, we will not give you interest per annum, we will give you interest per, let's say, quarter, right? Doesn't matter because I'm only going to earn interest on the original principal. But here, if the bank is going to give me interest per quarter, I will earn some interest in the first quarter. And in the second quarter, I'll earn interest on my principal plus that interest. So I'm earning interest on interest more frequently. And this will grow to being a bigger amount than this one. Are we clear with all this? Okay, moving on to future value. Does anybody know what we mean by future value? What is the value of your current position in the future? Yes. So if I put 100 in the, like we did, we put 1000 in the bank today, this is called present value. And it grew to become 1102.5, the future value. An amount uh, that will grow in the future is called the future value. If you want to do it the reverse, let's say you have a goal. You want to achieve 1102.5 in two years time. How much you need to put in the bank today, you're working in reverse. So you're going to take this amount and take it backwards. In other words, you're calculating the present value. So that's what the present value means. We often say a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. Why do we say this? Because of inflation. Money loses power over time. So I was born and brought up in Dubai. And what I could do with one dollar was buy a can of Pepsi. Guess what? I can't do that now. Right, because Pepsi itself is one and a half years. So um, money loses power over time. So if anyone says, would you like the payment today? Or would you like the payment after a month? Today, please, right? Because you can take that money, put it in the bank, and get it to grow. Payment after a month has lost value, and you've lost interest on it. All right, any questions? Okay, now, in almost all questions that you will be doing in book three, financial markets and products, you will need a timeline, right? You will need to track when money is going out, when it's coming in, so that you can facilitate your math. Please do not skip this simple tool. The questions will not ask you to create a timeline, but if you jump this step, I assure you, and this has been my experience in the past, unless you have a great memory and a mind to map things out, you will make a mistake, right? So don't fall into the trap, especially when we do complicated things like swaps and bond calculations, you will need this. So a timeline is basically charting out your inflows and outflows. When solving time value money questions, always start with a timeline. A timeline is a visual plot of the times on which money flows in and out. So this is money going out in the beginning, T0. Next year, money comes in, 300, and it consistently comes in at the end of each year. So of course, the symbols represent inflow, outflow. If it's also very important to be familiar with the language. So if I want to take this 300 and work out what it will be worth in the future at T4, we often say, I put 300, it will compound to an amount here in the future. On the other hand, I could do the opposite. I could ask myself, this money that is coming four years later, how much is it worth today? So in other words, I will take this money, bring it back. Bringing it back means shrinking it. Shrinking means I will discount it to present. 
So to calculate future value, we use a word from here, compound forward. To calculate present value, we use a term, discount. The timelines speed up the process of time value of money question solving and reduces the chance of mistake. Questions? Fantastic.